good uh, panel for you with Luisa Agat Jensen, ESG manager at PKA, the healthcare uh, pension fund in Denmark. Joost Slabberkorn, senior responsible investment and governance specialist at APG Asset Management, a pension provider for the biggest pension fund in the Netherlands. And Karin, Karin Aziz, head of responsible investment at KLP, the largest pension fund in Norway. And the moderator of this panel is Charlotte O'Leary, Executive Director of Pensions for Purpose. I welcome the panel on stage. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Charlotte O'Leary. I'm the CEO um, and Executive Director at Pension for Purpose. And just feeding into that really inspiring um, speech, we are a majority female-owned and female-managed business. So even more proud um, of that particular achievement. And we work as um, a bridge in impact investing to uh, channel capital into impact investments. We work with stakeholders, including pension funds like the panel we have now, investment consultants, asset managers, government, because we recognize that you can't get pension funds to shift unless you shift everybody. Um, so it's brilliant to have you all on the panel, and we're tackling quite a significant topic here, mobilizing capital at scale to tackle climate change and systemic issues. And we know that it's not just about carbon outputs, it's not just about climate change, it's also about inputs, about behavior, it's about inequality, biodiversity, and the challenges go on and on, and it's moving at quite a pace, particularly mm -hmm. now. I'd love to just, if you wouldn't mind, just introduce yourselves and just how you're thinking about this topic and how you're um, tackling it as an organization. You want yeah, me can to start? start? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Kieran Aziz. I'm Head of Responsible Investments at KLP Asset Management, which is part of KLP Group. And is it, it's Norway's largest pension company. We are mainly owned by the municipalities and the state healthcare entities, but we have also uh, external clients who invest in, in our funds. Um, and we have a long-term perspective, mainly passively invested. We follow MSCI index, invest in about 7,000 companies globally in over 70 countries. Um, and given the long-term perspective, we believe that the underlying economic activity in the investing companies should be responsible and sustainable for us to get the possible best return uh, on, on the investments. And this is mainly why we have been working with responsible investments for more than 20 years. So it's quite embedded in, in the investment strategy. And we have, and given, given that we also are from, from Nordics, where transparency is, is quite, uh, quite important. And we have some tools available. I think we will touch on that during the Perfect. conversation. Yeah, so my name is Joost Slavokorn. I'm part of the responsible investment team of APG Asset Management. We're a global asset manager, but very strongly rooted here in the Netherlands because our clients are dedicatedly uh, Dutch occupational pension funds. And indeed, as Peter already alluded to, uh, pension fund ABP is our main client um, and they are the fifth biggest pension fund in Europe and the biggest pension fund here in the Netherlands. So here in the Netherlands, there's, there's really a strong uh, view on, uh, f also from the participants uh, on systemic issues. I think climate change is really a number one topic where we've received many letters from participants asking what, what are we doing. So it's, it is at the core of, uh, of the decisions that, that we're making. Um, also as an asset manager, we last year signed up to being a signatory of the Net Zero Asset Manager Initiative and ABP has made a similar commitment. So we're working through what that means. We already have existing uh, climate targets. Uh, so very specifically, specifically for ABP, they have a target to reduce the carbon footprint. They have a target to allocate more to uh, renewable energy um, and, and overall also a target on sustainable development goals. So we have set out a taxonomy to map out products and services and how they relate to the uh, sustainable development goals. And we're also in a position to screen companies and, and see um, uh, to what extent they're, uh, they're contributing to the sustainable development goals. So that's really a little bit at the center of how 
systemic issues come, uh, come back together. It's both in engagements, but it's also in, in investing through uh, specifically contributing to the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, and my name is uh, Luise Ogerjensen, and I work at PKA. Um, PKA is one of the largest pension funds in Denmark. Um, we represent uh, most of the health sector in Denmark. Um, and talking about gender uh, equality, 90% of our members are women, which might also be why um, ESG and sustainability has been on the agenda for PKA for decades now. Um, it started already in the late uh, 80s, where it was the first time that members were asking us to do active ownership with a company. Um, so PKA has been on a long journey, um, and it's very much um, credited to our members that have been asking for this for, for decades. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so we, we have around 350,000 members and an asset under management of 54 billion uh, euros. Um, we have uh, just uh, we have we have targets both within uh, social investments and 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 other uh, ESG related factors. But if we look at climate, some of the commitments that we have been looking that we have at the moment, or uh, we have we have in uh, we have several thresholds uh, for coal and uh, coal mining and uh, oil, uh, oil oil sand sorry and utility companies that have uh, more than 20 percent of their uh, their revenue from coal. Um, then that was the more the early days where we started setting these thresholds. And today we have um, several targets. Uh, for example, uh, a target for increasing or investments in green in green investments. <coughs> Um, where PKA started in 2010, making uh, where we invested in our first windmill farm in Denmark. And based on this experience, um, we have been growing a team, and now we have a team of 30 people investing in uh, finding renewable energy that we can invest in, um, and, and have set a target for 2020 that we wanted 10% of our asset under management to be invested in, in green investments across different asset classes. Um, and now we, we reach that target and have set a new target of reaching 6.7 billion euros uh, by 2025. Um, and then as something new, the last year, uh, we've been working on uh, setting CO2, uh, carbon emission re reduction targets, um, where we have signed up to the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance and the uh, Paris Alliance Investment Initiative. Um, and are now working on how to how to face in all the asset classes and 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 to deal with this. So yes, yeah, so working as a very Thank you. Well, I think I think with all of that, we covered <laughs> significant number of assets um, and members, but also initiatives, frameworks, and I think it's 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 really tough for investors out there when we've got more than 50 voluntary uh, frameworks and um, disclosures initiatives. We've got CBAM. <laughs> now carbon asset pricing you know at the border there are so many things to tackle i think that point in the video right at the top where we were talking about empathy is really important that i think when we're operating this area we have to em have empathy with investors managers that are trying to transition because it is significant undertaking so what does this really mean tangibly we can talk about we could throw numbers around everywhere can't we in frameworks you know, pension funds and other institutional investors, pension funds representing over 56 trillion globally, are invested in companies all over the world that contribute to climate change. They can either be engaged with to transition, tilted away from, or divested from, the, the kind of dirty word. Please, could you describe how you think about these different routes to engaging with companies in order to meet your targets? And do you think that collaboration is the key? Maybe we'll start with you, Juice. Yeah, sure. Um, so engagement is, is hugely important, but there, there's also a, a limit to what you can do and to, uh, to, to the extent we want to be uh, involved in companies. So we've seen our largest client, ABP, uh, last year make a major announcement. Uh, they announced to stop investing in, in oil and gas producers with a very specific comment to the fact that they didn't see the, um, the potential for their engagement to, to be effective in this sector. Um, and that's, of course, that's a, that's a huge milestone because we're, uh, well, you could say you basically park an entire sector uh, outside of scope and, and you, you lose your influence over that. Um, so uh, as part of that, that announcement, uh, there was also a kind of an increased 
uh, engagement effort uh, with the demand side uh, uh, announced because quite often also in our conversations we heard kind of this chicken and egg problem so companies are saying you know we're, we're supplying products that people demand which, which is true um, so uh, ABP has made that step and, and aligned themselves so to say with the demand side and um, has included in that is an increased effort to work with these companies to change the, the way they demand energy and, um, and therefore hopefully also lower the demand for energy. So in a certain way we're still, we're still involved in the energy sector uh, indirectly, uh, but we will be influencing them through, uh, for engaging with the demand side. And I think in terms of collaboration, that's, that's very important. Uh, so we're actively involved in uh, the engagement initiative Climate X100 Plus. We're also the lead for a, a couple of companies. I think it brings a huge benefit in terms of setting a common agenda, uh, but also addressing more issues more structurally. Uh, so within Climate Action 100 Plus, there are also sector strategies, there are more sector collaborations, there is shared thinking among investors what a certain transition means for a sector. And through the net zero benchmark, uh, quite a lot of data is ultimately unlocked uh, that can help us then in assess companies as well. So even though uh, um, ABP has made this announcement, engagement is still hugely important and collaboration in, in engagement is, is really key. Thank you. That's really, um, that's really interesting. I think I'll come back to the point about demand, need and growth and um, some of the incentives around that because I think it's a really important point. But Louise, would you like to just come in with your perspective on um, how you go about trying to engage with companies and also um, collaborative initiatives? Yeah, for sure. Um, yes, so, um, so, so yeah, at PKA, we, we very much believe in active ownership. Um, that it is the best possible way, uh, and also collaborative engagements are the best possible way for us to, to maximize our influence on companies. Um, we are working towards, uh, like now we are committed to becoming CO2 uh, carbon neutral by 2050. Um, but uh, to be fair, it's, it's kind of hard to, to make, to accomplish that goal if the companies are not following. Um, we, we need to invest in companies and we need them to commit as well. So uh, engagement and active ownership is, is very much an important tool uh, for that. And that's also when, when you have the collaborative engagements, you just have, we just have a, a, a better chance or maximizing or, or for maximizing our influence. Um, we have in the past had uh, reached out to companies where we do not receive uh, a response simply because as one investor, even that we represent a large, as, um, a large um, asset under management, is still not enough um, for some of the biggest companies out there. But when you come together with um, 615 investors through Climate Action 100 Plus and you represent uh, 54, uh, 54 trillion Euro, uh, euros, then um, the company starts to listen and, and engage with you and, 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 and are willing to have a dialogue with you. So that's really positive and so we're very supportive of that. And we have actually decided at PKA that uh, when Climate Action 100 Plus, the initiative, when, when the first part of the initiative is ending in 2023, we have said <clears throat> that we will uh, evaluate the company, companies uh, based on the initiatives final evaluation and whether they have set plans for how their, their business will be Paris aligned uh, by 2050 and then uh, we will consider to divest from the companies that have decided not to. Um, so that also brings back um, engagement. There's often a discussion going on whether you should uh, uh, engage or divest but also if we engage and there's never any consequences and the companies know that then maybe engagements it will be harder for engagement to really gain a momentum so so well the, we, we believe that does need to be a consequence for example one consequence is also if if a company does not want to go into a dialogue with us and engage with us we well if we can't have a dialogue we cannot drive them towards um, more sustainable path so then we also we, we divest um, already there um, so, so there needs to be a consequence of engagement if, if it's not moving anywhere or if you don't have, an, have a, a, a dialogue with them. But, <clears throat> but we do believe in active ownership is the right way to go about it. Also, if, if, if we do not, uh, again, it's, it's hard to have a diversified portfolio if, 
if uh, you can only invest in, uh, in banks and consultancy companies because they have a naturally low carbon emission. So we need, we need all the sectors to, to work towards a, a greener future. So. Karen, if you could pick that up, but also um, I think it's useful to tie in at this point because what we are talking about engaging with companies and um, you can have regulation to kind of create a threshold, but what about incentivization? So getting companies to embed and value the shift to a sustainable economy and society critically because that hasn't necessarily been mentioned so far is difficult in a world focused on growth and incentivized to continue to pursue growth. And you've just mentioned a really good example, which is there's still demand. Well, is, does that, is that about need or is that just about the demand that you're generating? Um, so how do you look to tie the incentives of your managers with your environmental, social and governance targets? Because that seems to be a critical tool in the armory. Yeah, I can uh, just to follow up on that. Uh, we had pretty much the same approach as um, as my co-panelists, and it also has to do, like you said, Louisa, that you know we be depending on being invested in the companies, um, and we, we were one of the first pension companies to exclude coal back in 2014, and it was quite early on. And given that we are from Norway, which is quite heavily dependent on mm -hmm. oil. And, um, oil and gas, and we adopted roadmap towards Paris last year. And one of the main elements there is that we would like to use the shareholder uh, access to, to influence the companies. But like if you have 7,000 companies, you are not able to engage with all of them. So you have to make some priorities. I think it's, it's quite fair that we have the biggest holdings in Norway, that it will be closer to our market. But at the same time, look at also some of the sectors such as oil and gas, cement, mm -hmm. uh, steel production uh, to mention. And, and the third thing is that we also need to remember that, like it was mentioned yesterday, that we also have a nature crisis, mm -hmm. and that we need to make sure that nature has the capacity to absorb and store carbon. Um, and then you also need to look at, you know, pound production or it could be agriculture. And, and I, at the same time, we also need to have a holistic approach because, you know, ESG, they affect each other. Yeah. And we see with climate change, there will be rapidly negative impact on human rights. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you measure that? It's, it's, you know, with climate, you probably can set some targets, but the negative impact on human rights, how do you measure that? Yeah. Um, so, and, and for, for the companies, when it, comes to, when it comes to collaboration, I think it's quite effectful that the investors come along, given mm. that we have the same concerns we would like and risk we would like to address. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really important that actually when we're setting um, net zero targets, thinking about climate change, that actually, you know, nature, biodiversity, inequality all feeds into that. And obviously that came up at COP26, it's going to be seen this year, and we've got a 21-point plan related to TNFD, which will be the next thing that will be coming around in the next couple of years, and we'll see um, sort of emerging initiatives on. But on this point, so many net zero frameworks have been better at addressing public and developed markets, recognizing this makes up the largest proportion of investment. However, in order to have a just transition, we need to consider investments in developing markets, as well as the fact that many of the technology solutions and innovation that you've mentioned are likely to come from private markets. So how are you reviewing your asset allocations in light of your climate targets and the need for leveling up? Do you want, actually, do you want to start with that, Kieran? So you didn't get yeah, you, we, for us, you know, listed companies and passive, this is our main product, at least in asset management, and this is what we uh, will be uh, doing, and we have some private equity, mm -hmm. um, but listed companies would be bond and equities would be yeah. our main product, yeah. uh, giving forward, and, and there is a huge debate now, and we get a lot of questions from media, you know, would we stop investing in emerging markets due to the war in Ukraine, uh, but there is huge potential in emerging markets, both when it comes to risk, but also to, also to opportunities. And, and you, you, that you can come as an investor from Norway and say, you know, ESG is quite core for us. I, I think we see, and they are very much keen to learn, and it, it will, it's much, I find it much more interesting to engage with companies in emerging markets. Mm. Yes. Yep. So I, I think this is uh, hugely important to also uh, address it in asset allocation. At the same time, that's perhaps even one of the most difficult things to do, also due to the regulatory framework that, that surrounds it and, and, and other big initiatives. We've had traditionally already a quite a big allocation to, to private markets. Um, 
and in, in, in addition, we are, yeah, we're working through what it exactly means to integrate more ESG in, in, um, in climate change, but there you also run into two objectives. So either do you want to minimize your risks or do you want to kind of optimize for, for impact? And, and that makes quite a difference because minimizing your risk kind of basically almost incentivizes you to, to step away from emerging markets where, where arguably most of the impact is, is to be made. Um, so that's, that's work ongoing. I think also more um, or more concretely and more tangible what we can already do is also be innovative within uh, certain asset classes. So quite recently we, we helped our clients to, um, to set uh, or to engage into a, a specific private debt fund in emerging markets with a strong SDG focus, quite an innovative product. And I think those kind of things can already help within uh, the boundaries of a certain asset class to, uh, to, to much more put front and center the, the SDGs and systemic issues in, in our investments. You've, you've all given some really nice examples about how you've been embedding it for a significant period of time and then also talking about collaboration. Um, we largely focus on the UK market, but we're looking at uh, Europe, US, um, Australia. And one of the things that we talk about is um, the use of 3D kind of portfolio optimization. So building in risk, return and impact on an equal footing so that when you're looking at an efficient frontier, you're actually building that, that into the way that you're structuring your um, allocations. Is that the sort of development that we need in order to get the mobilization of capital at scale rather than trying to change individual hearts and minds? I, I think it's also then uh, for a regulator to send a strong uh, point of view that they, yeah, they, they want this kind of op optimization. Um, it, there's definitely an appetite from, from pension boards, what I see is to, is to make sure that they can engage in the impact, but, but we're really constrained by the regulatory environment right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think all sorts of tools can help and at least now, getting started and getting a feel for it, what it means to make a certain uh, decision on, on overall the impact uh, will be a huge uh, a step already. Uh, that said, of course, it's uh, important to understand all the underlying assumptions and how things exactly work, but it can, it can definitely help in, uh, in terms of visualization uh, for a board what it means to, um, to make certain steps. Yeah. Lisa, do you have a view on that as well? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> it's a very interesting discussion, and uh, and I, th I very much agree with yours as well. Um, uh, um, there are, um, I would say that ESG is increasingly integrated in our in our um, investments in general, and considered broadly across all the uh, every time we make a new investment, uh, regardless of the asset class, uh, it is ESG is considered. Um, uh, uh, like re return and risk are as well, um, but we have not um, decided to use a, a tool like that yet. We do more have, um, again, it depends. We have different, um, we have different approaches depending on the asset class, how we integrate it, and then we we strive to to just to make this more and more ambitious and get it more and more well integrated. Mm -hmm. um, but we have uh, just in general, we have guidelines and policies and exclusion lists uh, that need to be complied with every time we make a new investment, then that's sent forward. We have an ESG due diligence, where then um, I'm in a close dialogue with our portfolio managers where every time we make an investment, uh, and then we will go through, also if it's just a strategic partnership and not even an investment, but just going into a partnership as well, we will evaluate uh, um, the company and, um, and the team and, and from the data that we have available through different data providers um, mm -hmm. and, and other, we are part of a, quite a few networks. Mm -hmm. um, I think also one, one, another way, place or way that we, as, that serves us as a tool uh, is certifications. Uh, especially within some asset classes like real estate at PKA or um, we have now we now have sustainability certifications in all of our new real estates um, constructed since 2015 I believe and we have a target now of having all of our real estates uh, all of our properties uh, certified with um, sustainable, sustainable certifications. Yeah. Um, and the same goes for our infrastructure investments. We're using the GRASP uh, certification as well. So, so there are different ways to go about it, but we do not have like one tool that's like, covering it all yeah, yeah. Um, at the moment, but it would be great in the future. And it, it is quite an important discussion.
And what about um, the emergence of um, trans sort of transparency and SFDR and these sorts of things? I've talked about it briefly at the, at the top, which is we need to have a bit of empathy because there are so many different frameworks and initiatives. How do you choose how, how and where to spend your time when there are so many different um, frameworks you can sign up to? We, we look at kind of the GINS investor survey and lots of people are using different criteria for setting impact objectives and then different um, criteria and tools in order to measure impact. How do you then determine what you use um, and which frameworks you sign up to? I, c I can yeah. start. Um, there are some best practices and standards if you talk about climate change, such as TCFD and CDP, and we urge the companies to use and report according to the same uh, frameworks. SFDR would be uh, a regulation, so this is something you have to yeah. comply with. But I, I think it's important to remember that it's not reporting itself, with, but the value you can extract from the reporting. Mm -hmm. and given that you know, ESG has been voluntary for, for a lot of actors, but now it's coming in the law, and I think you will see a totally different behavior. And for the consumers as well, that they compare the different kind of, uh, kind of uh, products. But transparency, I would say, is, is core. Uh, when we exclude a company, we, the easiest path would have been just to say that we have excluded a company, but we um, publish a quite thorough exclusion document where we give a thorough assessments on why we have excluded, why we see there is a future risk. And this is all to help the companies to see where we draw the line, uh, you know, as we see what is acceptable and unacceptable, but also for the other investors and stakeholders um, yeah. to, to see that. So, uh, yes, transparency, we expect transparency from the companies, and we should, as investors should also live up to the same. Um, I just want to also offer the opportunity for anyone to ask any questions. I feel that I've hogged their time quite a lot, and we've had some really, really good um, answers. Oh, great, good. I don't know how you want to go about getting questions from the floor. Just this gentleman. Yes, there is always one. outside. Oh, okay. And Perfect. the question was, you talked about cooperation in uh, engagement. But what are the conclusions of the panelists when engagement doesn't achieve the results you want to? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Yeah, th um, now ultimately, even though uh, there are these collaborative engagement in initiatives, it's ultimately up to everyone themselves to make, that, uh, to make that evaluation right. Because investors have their own policies and investors uh, are, are also bound by uh, not colluding, so to say. So, uh, yes, there is a, a common set of information, but there is an, uh, a different evaluation. And you'll see uh, people kind of making, or, or different funds, also based on their, their characteristics and their uh, decisions, making different uh, conclusions, such as, for example, ABP saying, we, uh, um, we will divest from oil and gas producers, and many other funds uh, are still continuing to invest. And I think that's, that's also fair. It's, an, it's, an, it's your own evaluation. <coughs> yeah, sorry, just think. Okay. Good morning, my name is Yvonne Bakkum. I represent FMO and also the Netherlands Advisory Board on Impact Investing. This panel is about mobilizing capital at scale. So I had expected to hear about massive shifts of capital and we heard Rosemary Addis saying yesterday we need to be transformational and proactive rather than incremental and reactive. And what you're talking about, engagement, some divestment initiatives, to me that sounds relatively incremental and reactive. So I'm wondering what withholds your boards or other decision makers around you to be much bolder and really reallocate capital so that indeed we do mobilize at scale. Do you want to <laughs> Louise, do you want to talk about that big proactive? I, I can uh, add to that. Um, yeah, just a comment on that. Uh, yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, PKA started invest. We made our first green investment in a windmill farm in, in 2010. Um, that was uh, a direct investment, uh, and we had one employee sitting and, and focusing on that investment. Uh, then, based on this experience um, from gained from this investment. Um, we quickly started seeing uh, more opportunities within renewable energy in direct investments and, uh, and, and started uh, yeah, uh, 
hiring a larger team. Now this team has become 30 uh, employees and they have actually um, become the, a subsidiary to PKA, so they have an office um, somewhere else in Copenhagen, but they invest in all the infrastructure on our behalf and it's all within renewable energy, which is now, it is definitely the largest uh, part of our green investments. Uh, I, I think it's almost 70% of our green investments, or 60, 60, 70% of our green investments are within renewable energy. Now we're looking at power to X as well. And yeah, so we have this, uh, so that has been a great success for us. And I think the reason that this, like what, what enabled this was for us, starting back in 2010, having, seeing an opportunity and daring to act on it, even that it was an, sort of investment that we had never had any experience with before but then we made that first one and so based on that experience um, it was possible to then start to scale up and we have we have similar we have had similar experiences um, with uh, within uh, uh, private equity where we have invested in some funds uh, with, together with the Danish IFU so it has been and the Danish state, so it's <clears throat> blended finance, where we have invested in funds focusing on climate change in um, climate action in, um, in the emerging markets, but also microfinance in, in different markets. And the way that what actually, what we gained from these sorts of experiences have been that we entered with blended finance in the first funds uh, together with the Danish state and public support. And then, um, based on the experience and the, uh, the, the competences we gained there, uh, we then uh, have then eventually later on entered such uh, similar funds alone without the blended finance, without the, yeah. the support from the public sector and the, the IFU. So yeah, so it, um, so yeah, so it is, there are ways to, to, to scale it up. Um, yeah, and I, I hear that, you know, I think everybody feels very motivated in the room that we need to be doing more. Um, at Pension for Purpose, we actually talk to people about having this three-dimensional lens when you're investing and we work with pension funds that are using an S SDG lens for every investment that they make and we talk about the compatibility of fiduciary duty and what we're talking about is transformational thinking and it's not just pension funds it's asset managers it's investment consultants it's economists it's the finance world it's the fact that we use GDP as a measure of output um, and it's really, really tricky to make those changes. Really, really tricky. But I think we do all need to acknowledge in this room that we can all do more. Um, but we need to be empowered to do that. We need to empower people with financial education, whether that's members, whether that's people on boards, in-house teams, and we stop need to operating in silos. So having ESG specialists, sustainability specialists, impact specialists, they're all integrated. This is about good investment. Um, and so it'd be great to hear about how you're thinking about that, that transformational thinking. Um, just to address the first question, I feel I have to do yeah, that. You know, we are, given that you are a pension fund, you have some commitments and mandate. And within that, what you can do is that you can launch new products. And we have some uh, 10 Nordic Eco Label um, funds, which are mainly um, very much focused on uh, climate friendly uh, investments, but at the same time at the group level in KLP, we are invested in emerging markets, in infrastructure, uh, and different kind of collaborations. And I think we are, as, as a pension, pension company, you understand that you need to diversify, and within that room we will see what kind of uh, space you have to, to invest in the projects. I think there are some questions in the audience yes, still, yes. and I have another one from the sure. audience outside. But perhaps first the audience here. Thank you. Um, Vipul Bhagat, I've um, spent uh, many decades working in the emerging markets, uh, and I'm uh, impact advisory uh, firm now. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something I think one of the panelists said, maybe it was just about um, climate change uh, and, you know, how do we address the systemic issues on climate change? And I think it was mentioned that uh, you can't do too much, well, we can do more in the emerging markets as opposed to in the developed markets. And I just want to challenge that notion, maybe I didn't hear it incorrectly, but sometimes I think we feel uh, collectively that because so much has already been built in the developed world, we shouldn't, you know, we sort of sort of throw up our hands and say, well, 
new power plants are being built in China and India and Brazil, so let's work, on, le let's work there. Um, I totally disagree with that notion. I think we have to take the responsibility in the built world to change things that we have built incorrectly if we are to be serious about mobilizing and doing something about climate change. So I don't know if that's what you meant, uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just want to uh, at least put that notion on the table that I think if we, ha we have a collective responsibility, uh, and that, that's what was embodied in the pa Paris Agreement and many other agreements that we've all signed up to. And I think we let people off the hook when we say it's only China and India and Brazil that have to address climate going forward. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, what, I, what I didn't want to, uh, what I didn't mean is that it's a responsibility for emerging markets. I mean, obviously, developed markets have been uh, uh, the biggest culprit uh, for, for climate change. I rather meant that we don't want to take our finance uh, off the table because emerging markets are kind of inherently more risky and even more risky if you take a, a climate vulnerability lens. So if, if you would optimize your portfolio for, for climate risk, there is a risk you take finance away from emerging markets where they arguably need it to, uh, to continue to develop and, and develop so in a, uh, in a way that, uh, that also sets them up for a, a climate-proof future. So I agree with you. Okay, just, we've got a minute. So just, oh no we don't, we have to, oh, sorry, no we don't, we have to close. Well thank you very much to the panel, thank you very much for your questions, obviously a very energetic an interesting um, debate, and there is always more that we can be doing in this area, whether it's developed or developed markets or anywhere else. And I ask, I excuse that I have to interrupt because Sorry. we have uh, st stick to the program. But, 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 there were more, more, there were more questions. Please come forward after this panel and ask them the, yourself. Uh, we have now a coffee break, um, and thank you to the panel. Running inside.